Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Josh Mallerman is a New York Times bestselling author and one of the two singer-songwriters for the rock band The High Strung. His debut novel, Bird Box, is the inspiration for the hit Netflix film starring Sandra Bullock. His latest, Mallory, is a thrilling sequel to Bird Box in which our hero has a harrowing choice to make, to live by the rules of survival that have served her so well, or to venture into the darkness and reach for hope once more. Now let's join editor Trisha Narwani in conversation with author Josh Mallerman. Thank you for joining us today, Josh. It's so exciting to have you here. Yes, it's exciting to talk to you. You and I exchange infinite emails. So to hear your voice is awesome. Hi. You've been doing a lot of reading in quarantine. You also wrote a <laughs> whole novel under some unusual circumstances. So tell us about Carpenter's Farm and how that came about. Carpenter's Farm is an idea I've had for a long time about a fella who moves onto a farm and uh, what grows out there is a lot more interesting than potatoes. It was the first short story I ever had published. It was called A Fiddlehead Party on Carpenter's Farm. And I knew it when I published it that it was going to be a prequel to the novel I wanted to write one day. I just, I wanted to get the idea out there. I didn't have the novel yet, so that was the first story. And a few years ago, I was like, okay, I got it. I'm going to write the novel. And I made it about 40,000 words deep, which as you know, that's totally significant. And... I was like, no, this is boring. Like the way I'm doing this is just, this isn't it. And the only time I ever consider a novel a failure is if you don't finish it. Honestly, anything else, good, bad, that those are all for someone else to say. But if you don't finish it, man, come on. And so it's haunted me for a long time. And then this year in February, I was standing in my driveway. I can remember this. And I don't know why it just struck me out of nowhere that the way to tell this story was by way of a group of thespians who live in New York City and who travel to Carpenter's Farm for a reason. And then once I had that, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm writing this book in April. Then the pandemic came. And then I start seeing people online strapped for cash, people worried, friends, family, people out of work. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like, how can I help? How can I be a part of this to make them feel a little brighter? And my webmaster happened to call me saying, hey, you've had the same short story for free on your site for four years. Do you want to put up a different one? And I was like, well, I don't have one right now. And he's like, do you want to write one? I was like, no, I want to write Carpenter's Farm. I want to write this novel. What do you think, Todd, if we serialize an entire novel for free on the site? And he was like, great, let's do it. Enormous kudos to Todd Jackson for facilitating the whole thing. And really what it ended up being was, and still is, because it's all up there now, was a free serialized novel, full length novel. It's longer than Bird Box. I did it as live as you can get, meaning I wrote it, I checked it, you checked it, and then I posted it. I never ran into a moment, like mercifully, never encountered a moment where I was like, "Uh oh, I need to backtrack or anything like that. It just freaking worked. And sometimes those first drafts do that and sometimes they don't. And thank heavens that one did because that one was in front of people. It was incredible to watch you do this. It was like you were on a tightrope in front of a live audience with no net, but carrying a typewriter <laughs> the, book the whole time. <laughs> Every now and then I'd say to myself, hey, look, if it goes the wrong direction, if it's like a chapter's terrible, everyone kind of understands this is live. But then you say that, but then when you are going to post it, like you don't want that. You don't want to be like, well, you'll understand if it's bad, right? No, you want to be good. So, <laughs> so that, that calmed me down, but it also, you know, it didn't change the fact that I actually wanted to go well. The greatest thing possibly about the Carpenter's Farm experiment is that I had put out the bat signal to other artists if you want to draw pictures, if you want to add music. And unbelievably, a lot of people did, including Chris Campbell, who ended up writing a 76-minute score for the novel, which is interesting because the novel is 76,000 words. Just oh. think that. And then Shane Douglas Keene did a poem for every chapter. Michael Bailey did a novella based on it. Jimmy Doom, a short story, and so forth. Just a ton of stuff. So it started to become sort of like, hey, we're all in lockdown. Here's something for free. And also, here's something serialized to look forward to that's not just TV. The only downside of this whole thing is that when the novel ended, it was like, we did it! And then it was like, 
but we're still on lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was definitely like an incredible, magical collective moment. And the best part is the book is fantastic. So I, I recommend everyone after this podcast, go read it immediately. <laughs> it is free on the website. There are no comments, no number of views, no likes, dislikes. It's literally just sitting there to be read. So Bird Box, your first novel, was also written under some kind of special circumstances. Um, a little bird told me there's a story about an attic full of birds. So I sometimes still operate this way, but I certainly used to be sort of something of an assembly line where it didn't matter if I was inspired or not for the next idea. Whatever the next idea was, I was going to write it. And I was renting in the third floor of like this awesome mansion in this district of Detroit called Boston Edison. And that third floor was like a ballroom a little bedroom, a little bathroom, and a little kitchen. And in that big open ballroom space was this giant dark wood desk. And I had written parts of other books there. And, and I had an image of a woman and two kids blindfolded in a rowboat. And that's all I knew. That's all I had to go on. But I knew that, that like I said, that was the next idea. Let's start writing about it. Let's see what happens. And by page two, I started to get concerned, like, wait a minute, what are they doing? <laughs> Who are they fleeing? You know, I mean, you know, we're talking earliest of really day one, right? And in that early stretch, I bought a bunch of finches to fly freely around that big ballroom open space. Every morning, I woke up at 7 a.m. The birds were freely flying around and active that early. And I sat down at about 8 and wrote till about 11.30 or noon. And it was about 4,300 words a day. Just an absolutely fluid, rough draft experience where by the time you go to bed at night, you know what you're going to write the next morning. And any writer in the world knows that's like a gift from the writing gods because a lot of the time you're like, ah, what do I do now, right? But I just, I knew every time what was going to happen next. And in the course of writing that book, next to me, this is going to sound a little cheesy to someone, but it's true. Next to me on the ground was the box the Finches came in. And I started to say to myself, this box is kind of like a, I guess, like a metaphor for what the housemates are going through. And it was like the birds in the box, the housemates in the house, the all of humanity on planet Earth, right? They're all in the big wooden box of what the creatures have opened, right? About halfway through it, it was untitled. And halfway through it, I just titled it Bird Box because I was sitting with, that's what, you know, it's sitting next to me and it struck me. You know, years later, when it gets picked up and published and all that, I loved the title or, or I became like kind of married to it because that's what I had used. What I really liked about it was that I felt like it represented the story as a whole without a title like End Times, right? Or, 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 or <laughs> Don't Look, you know? Yeah, it's, it's like, haunting for reasons you can't really put your finger on, but yeah. you know that there's something, there's something sinister about it. Yeah, honest to God, that box was, I can still see it. I can still like see the Petco box, you know, sitting next to me on the ground and, and being like, all right, yeah, that's a good title. Yeah. I'd heard that story before, but I hadn't heard the story about the box specifically. It's yeah. true that there are these moments that are like gifts from the writing gods, but it sounds like you prepared for it by showing up every day. I could not agree with you more, Trisha. It's like, I think that inspiration is something of sort of like an inverse monster, right? Instead of like showing up in the room and rawr, it doesn't enter the room. It's always outside of the room. And you're like, almost like waiting, Where's when's inspiration coming? And it's tick tock, tick tock, it's not coming, it's not coming. And it's almost this like villainous thing to me, inspiration. And what I mean is, instead of waiting for it, I sit down and try to work on books, you know, every day in some fashion or another. And I'm of the mind that if you do that for months at a time, weeks at a time, if you went back and read what you wrote, you will have no idea which days you were supposedly inspired and which ones you were not. And once you discover that for yourself, once you truly see that for yourself, why not write every time you can? Why not write every day? And so, mm -hmm. like you said, to be fortuitous, you know, and there's that whole like opportunity, luck, all that thing. Well, it's, it's true. It's like you're preparing yourself for a moment like that, for a box sitting next to you, for a break, for a breakthrough by just working whether you feel like it or not. You made this commitment to write every day. Do you have any other rituals that get you into the creative headspace so those magical moments can happen? Like, do you have to play music? Do you like to be in a specific physical place? And so on. I usually, and definitely with Bird Box and Mallory, or Mallory was really fascinating because I wrote that to the soundtrack of Bird Box, which the movie, which that, that, <laughs> that trip. But I usually play horror soundtracks in the office 
or sometimes even just like go on YouTube and I'll find like the sound of wind, you know, four hours of wind or four <laughs> hours of storm. You know, and it's funny after a while you, you just think it's windy outside. It's amazing. So in other words, I do try to like trance out into it. I look at it as something of a dance that I'm dancing with horror stories in this office, slow dancing usually in horror with horror stories in this office. And there's some sense of like an invisible drummer, which I know that sense of rhythm and beat comes from being in a band for 20 years with my best friends. The biggest, I guess I would say ritual, it's, it's more like there's that moment of deciding, okay, I'm ready to write. And then I always know that about an hour later is when it actually begins. So there's always this one sort of moment of like, okay, we're going to do it. And then like an hour later, I'm actually sitting down and doing it. And whatever that pattern is, I don't know what that is exactly, but that's been true to me for a long time now. Speaking of Mallory, writing that book was itself a journey, not unlike Mallory and the kids on that river. <laughs> what was the process of writing Mallory like? This is interesting to me in hindsight because I changed methodology halfway through this experience. I've never done something like that before, but I had written the way I normally do, which is just sort of like barfing out the rough draft and then we'll worry about it later. And then I made it, you know, almost, I made it to the end, whatever, we're rewriting it, editing, whatever. And then I was like struck with a better idea, ditched what was there already. And in the meantime, in the middle of this, I had seen a post by Joe Lansdale in which he was talking about how he has one working draft all the time. That That's all he works with. So he was talking about he edits as he goes. He writes next day, rewrites that, writes, rewrites that and so forth. Halfway through, he'll check the whole thing. And as you know, it got to the point with Mallory where I think I was sending you, what was it, every 10,000 words? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I so, serializing it for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And for me, that was incredible because I was rewriting it as, as I went, which I've never done before. And every 10,000 words, I send it to you because the way I saw it was like, I just didn't want to get to that, what, what we call sort of lost at sea moment, about 50,000 words deep, where you're like, I have no idea what's going on anymore. <laughs> and, and I didn't want, I was trying to avoid that moment. And one way to do that, rewrite every day and write some new stuff and then show someone the like act one, act two, and especially you, yeah. who's a brilliant editor. So I'm like, okay, Trisha's still cool 10,000 deep. She's cool 20,000 deep. She had this suggestion here, here, you know, so that by the time you got to 50, you felt like you were working on this one solid draft versus this nebulous, oh my God, I hope this is right. So Mallory was a breakthrough for me, no doubt about it, in terms of style, in terms of methodology. And I will absolutely, the next, probably the next n number of books I write, I'm going to do that again that same way. How did the idea of writing a sequel to Bird Box, which was this incredible worldwide phenomenon, come about? So it was threefold, really. The first one is that the original draft of Bird Box was about twice as long as what came out. I removed a thread because I had started thinking back then, and I still think this kind of thing now, I'm very aware of trying not to, what I call like dilute the, the fear. I want the fear to, in most of these stories, and especially Bird Box and Mallory, to be, you could play one note on an organ, low note on a synthesizer through the entirety of the book. And there was another thread in Bird Box that made it so you couldn't do that. You had to kind of play a little bit more and there was more to it. You remove that thing and what, what remained was a lot more tense, focused, etc. So, but that thread was exciting to me. So through the years, I'm like, am I gonna ever use that thread? And Kristen, my agent, she would say, you know, hey, are you ever considering doing a sequel to Bird Box? I'd be like, oh, I don't know, Kristen, I have a million ideas, but, I, but there is that thread that I removed from the first one. So that was always lurking. Then the second thing is that Allison and I went and saw the movie at um, Netflix headquarters in LA, <laughs> in, a, in a screening room called uh, The Upside Out. Wow. <laughs> and, I, and I turned to Allison at the end and I was like, well, now what happens to her? And, you know, it's, as goofy as that sounds, it's totally true. And she's like, um, <clears throat> I think that's up to you. So we thought at that moment that that's as good as it gets. I mean, how could you not, right? I mean, you're like, you just saw the movie Sandra Bullock, this unbelievable movie star is the lead in your book. Everything was just amazing. And then the movie came out and then was like the wind tunnel. Oh my God, what is going on with Bird Box right now? So if you, those three things, the thread that I removed, watching Sandra Bullock as Mallory and the success of the movie all were like, hey dude, you know what? Let's write the next one right now. That led to, let, let's do it. And talking to you and Del Rey and then and here we are. Yeah. 
Well, I think one of the magic moments for me in this process is when you told me the title, you said that it had to be Mallory. And the second you said that, I was like, of course, that's the only title because this has kind of always been her story. Yeah. You know, through the years, people will talk to me about the creatures. But Mallory always, when she comes up, I don't know, there's something just special about her to me. And I've always felt, I don't want to say that she's like the, because no character is like easy to write, right? But there's, it's the most like fluid relationship I've ever had with a character is Mallory. I, I see her or, or almost like I would behave exactly as she did in both these books. And in Bird Box, that means mostly a fly on the wall and in Mallory as well. It's almost 17 years deep into this experience for her. And I think that I would still be like, yeah, this all sounds good. I'm all for everyone trying things in progress. At the same time, I'm 100% going to live by the blindfold because I know that it works. And it's more important to me that we all live through this and, you know, experience life as best we can through all this, rather than like her son, Tom thinks, you know, make as much progress as possible and, and caution be damned. So Mallory's always been a sister to me, borderline twin sister to me. So yeah, when I was like sitting down to work, I'm like, yeah, this one's called Mallory. Yeah, she is truly an unforgettable and amazing character. Several times over the course of this conversation, you've used musical metaphors to describe the writing process. Um, that's because in addition to being this incredibly accomplished writer, you're also a musician. So what led you to picking up the pen and writing a book? Well, it was almost the other way around because when I was younger, I made these comic books, which are really, this is interesting to me in hindsight. There was never a, a story through them. It was each page was its own character and then a description of the character. And in hindsight, that, that seems to me like the beginnings of a writer's mind. And there was like something more conceptual or something. I don't know how to explain that, but that led to, ooh, wow. Like a whole box that I have here of really embarrassing emo poems. And then, <laughs> and then <laughs> holy cow. And I thought, oh. Life is Strange by Josh Mal, you know. And then, um, <laughs> and then that led to trying to write short stories. And, and, and real fast, allow me this. The first one I ever tried was about a, a model that had this, this photographer was like obsessed with this model and she had this look about her and he, he didn't know what it was, but there was this look in her eye and then he sneaks into her dressing room, right? What is he doing? And in the dressing room, he sees her remove two glass eyes. She didn't have any eyes at all. And the whole time, the whole look in her eye, it was you know, not even human, not even real, not even there. That's the first short story I ever tried to write. I was like, you know, 16 or something. And at some point, my buddies, my bandmates, because you know how things are at that age, 18, 19, 20, everything's by proximity. Everyone, who's in the room? Let's, let's all hang out. They were all playing music and they were like, you write, maybe you could write songs. And that led to that one of them buying me an organ. I learned a few chords on it. That led to me falling in love with that. That led to my songwriting partner, Mark, reading those bad poems of mine and some of his over me playing the organ. And we were both like bitten by the songwriting bug. So and at the same time, him and I started trying to write novels. And so the whole book song thing was, they both like branched off and developed at the same time. The music side, I 100% owe to my best friends who were, who were just insanely like, well, you write, write music, right? <laughs> um, I mean, but that's 19 year old logic, right? And, and it's good, I like that. But the writing did come first. And it has always been like the trying to write stories has always has always been where it is. So through the years, it's been a bit of a juggling act. And as you know, the book side has been like really incredible. But that doesn't mean that it has to eclipse the, the music side at all. And we are working on a new album as we speak. I'm so excited for that. While you were writing these emo poems and these creepy stories, who were some of the writers you were reading that were very influential on your work and development as a writer? I went through like a mostly horror stretch in, I grew up in the eighties. The very first scary book I ever read was Dean Koontz, The Face of Fear. And I'll never <laughs> ever forget that feeling of, oh my God, this is all I want to read for the rest of my life. Obviously Stephen King and other eighties horror novels. At some point though, I started going into the classics and I started picking them up. Virginia Woolf, Carson McCullers, William Faulkner, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, just dun, 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 um, Count of Monte Cristo, like a classic, 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 classic for a few years. And I got to Dracula and I was like, oh yeah, Dracula. I haven't, I haven't read Dracula. And this is a classic, right? It was the mindset I was in. And I read that book and it was like, 
the gates of heaven or hell <laughs> opened up and I was like, you can write a classic that's also a horror novel. I was a young aspiring writer and reader and Dracula brought it all full circle for me and has catapulted me into like, like I said, like decades of a strict horror diet. Recently, I've been expanding outside of it again, as you know, with yeah. Tony Morrison, who's beloved. Wow. Like I've had the book for a while and I've been intimidated to read it because it's a classic. But I think there's this misconception that a classic would be um, difficult or dense. But I think one of the things we forget is that a classic novel is probably also readable. And I didn't expect that from Beloved. I just, I didn't. I finished it in like a few nights. It's unfathomably infused with power. And that's sort of the ultimate goal, I think, as a writer, and especially one who's interested in both what would be considered literary and genre, is that balance of power, legit weight and power with readability and like that propulsion behind it. Beloved is one of the best books I've ever read in my life. And I read it like last week. That book is a colossus for a reason. <laughs> yep. I first read Toni Morrison in high school with Song of Solomon. And it's the first book that when I finished it, I turned back to the first page to read it again. Like it was like an album that I really loved. That aura that the classics have, I think it, pre it does prevent some people from reading them. Like I know you also love Moby Dick. That book is actually just a lot of fun. It's completely insane. Yeah, and I have this amazing tour edition that makes it look like it's just like an adventure story. It's like a mad captain, you know, a worried crew, a killer whale. I mean, that's like kind of like what, you know what I mean? And <laughs> it's this awesome like painted like adventurous cover. And I read that version of it. And honestly, that's what it read like. That book and Beloved has this and definitely, oh my gosh, Philip Roth has this. Edgar Allan Poe is maybe the king of this, is that frenetic writing where you could like feel, oh my God, you could just feel that they were like so on fire while they were writing it. And not every great book has to be that way or should be that way. Um, I love deliberate. I love focused. I love slow. I love fast. I love, there's a million different ways to do it. But Moby Dick to any listeners is, is exactly what you said. It's the perfect example of the fact that a classic doesn't mean that you have to like trudge through this thing, that you have this giant dictionary next to you, that like a teacher is sitting across from you explaining it. No, it's just, it's great and it's alive. And usually it's the thing that makes it classic has more to do with the message and the spirit of the author than like any writing that's beyond you. I could talk to you for hours about writers that we love, <laughs> but I know that you're also a big film fan. Are there any filmmakers or films that have been especially important to your work as a writer? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like every horror author would say this, but but Hitchcock is just, it's immeasurable. And, and for me, especially because I'm a big fan of what I consider to be the prolifics, Guided by Voices, the band is like that. Stephen King's obviously like that. Alfred Hitchcock, guy put out a movie a year, his first, I don't know how many, but his first batch were silent films, not because, not some artistic choice, that's the era he was in. And he made about a movie a year all the way up to like 60, 63 is The Birds. And then his heyday is really Vertigo, Rear Window, Psycho, The Birds. And we're talking like 50s, late 50s, 60 is Psycho, 63 is The Birds. So he's not only inspirational in delivery and in art, but he's also inspirational in productivity and the fact that he got better with age. Everything about that package to me is just like, oh, it feels so good. Like to think that I, I've written 32 novels and I think Mallory's the ninth one that's coming out. So like to think I'm still like 20 years away from where Hitchcock hit his stride. I mean, that's just, that's some heavy stuff. Why can't an artist just get better as they age? And Hitchcock is the ultimate example of that. Well, Josh, if Mallory is only your like mid-career masterpiece and we have decades more of incredible work from you, I know I'm excited about it. <laughs> I hope that you and I get to do, let me just check, 50 more books together. <laughs> that is my hope as well. <laughs> well, Josh, thank you so much for talking to me today. If anyone would like to hear more from you, where can they find you online? Well, it's easy enough because everything... I must be the only Josh Mallerman in the world, and it's only one L, M-A-L-E-R-M-A-N, because I'm Josh Mallerman on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, my author page, and my website are all, it's just my name. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you, listeners. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Today's episode was brought to you by our friends at Dell Radio. 
If you love books with a dash of science fiction, fantasy, or horror, be sure to check out Dell Radio. That's D-E-L-R-E-Y-D-I-O. It's a podcast run by Del Rey, the world's foremost publishers of speculative fiction. Tune in every Thursday for exclusive interviews between your favorite science fiction and fantasy authors and their editors. And hear all about the nerdy books, games, and media that is bringing the Del Rey staff joy. You can find Del Radio wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And now, here's an exclusive excerpt from the audiobook, courtesy of Penguin Random House Audio. Tom is getting water from the well. It's something he's done every other day for the better part of a decade. The three of them having called Camp Yadin home for that long. Olympia believes the camp was once an outpost in the American frontier days. She's read almost every book in the camp library, more than a thousand, including books on the history of Michigan. She says the camp lodge was most likely once a saloon. Cabin one was the jail. Tom doesn't know if she's right, though he has no reason not to believe her. It was a Jewish summer camp when the creatures came, that much is for sure. And now it's home. Hand over hand, he says, taking the rope that connects cabin three to the stone lip of the well. He says it because, despite the ropes that tie every building to one another, and even link cabin 10 to the H dock on the lake, he's trying to come up with a better way to move about. Tom loathes the blindfolds. Sometimes, when he's feeling particularly lazy, he doesn't use one at all. He keeps his eyes closed, but his mother's never-ending rules remain firm in his mind. Closing your eyes isn't enough. You could be startled into opening them, or something could open them for you. Sure, yes. In theory, Mallory is right. In theory, she usually is. But who wants to live in theory? Tom is 16 years old now. He was born into this world and nothing's tried to open his eyes yet. Hand over hand, he's almost there. Mallory insists that he check the water before bringing it up. She's told him the story of two men named Felix and Jules many times. How his namesake, Tom the man, tested the water the two brought back, the water everybody was worried could be contaminated by a creature. Tom the teen likes that part of the story. He relates to the test. He even relates to the idea of new information about the creatures. Anything would be more to work with than what they have. But he's not worried about something swimming in their drinking water. The filter he invented himself has taken care of that. And besides, despite the way Mallory carries on, even she can't believe water can go mad. Here, he says. He reaches out and touches the lip before bumping into it. He's made this walk so many times that he could run it and still stop before the stone circle. He leans over the edge and yells into the dark tunnel. Get out of there! He smiles. His voice echoes. The sound is a rich one. And Tom likes to imagine it's someone else calling back up to him. For as lucky as they are to have chanced upon an abandoned summer camp with numerous buildings and amenities, life gets lonely out here. Tom is the best, he hollers, just to hear the echo. Nothing stirs in the water below, and Tom begins to bring the bucket up. It's a standard crank, made of steel, and he's repaired it more than once. He oils it regularly, too, as the camp giveth in all ways a supply seller in the main lodge that brought Mallory to tears ten years ago. A pipeline that delivers water directly to us, Tom says, cranking. We could put it exactly where the rope is now. It passes through the existing filter. All we'd have to do is turn a dial and presto, clean water comes right to us. No more hand over hand on the rope. We wouldn't have to leave the cabin at all. Not that the walk is difficult, and any excuse to get outside is a good one. But Tom wants things to improve. It's all he thinks about. The bucket up, he removes it from its hooks and carries it back to cabin three, the largest of the cabins, 
the one he, Olympia, and Mallory have slept in most of these years. Mom rules won't allow Tom or Olympia to sleep anywhere else, despite their growing needs, a rule that Tom has so far followed. Spend all day in another one if you need to, but we sleep together. Still, a decade in. Tom shakes his head and tries to laugh it off. What else is there to do? Olympia has told him in private about the differences in generations that she's read about in her books. She says it's common for teenagers to feel like their parents are from another planet. Tom definitely agrees with the writers on that front. Mallory acts as if every second of every day could be the moment they all go mad. And Tom and Olympia both have pondered aloud in their own ways the worth of a life in which the only aim is to keep living. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Erin Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us. Thank you.